Are you filled with fear, doubt, worry about the future of our country? Do you feel the urgency to act before it's too late? If yes, then this podcast is for you. It's time for us to confront the critical issues threatening our nation's fabric, our democracy itself, regardless of our political stance. If you are ready to face reality, handle the tough questions, and find real solutions, then here's your host, Debbie Lynn Molino. Welcome to the Terrified Nation podcast. I'm your host, Debbie Lynn Molino. Can we save our country? Well, that's what we're exploring in this podcast. And for me, the answer is a resounding yes, we can and we must. Now, this show is where we explore alternatives to being afraid. And I offer new perspectives and framing about what's really going on. Together, we learn how to manage our fear, our anger, our rage. And we learn how to find hope in a world that just seems crazy some days. It is up to us, the citizens of this great, flawed, beautiful, and sometimes ugly nation, to live into the promise of our founders, each one of us dedicating ourselves to a better future. I do like to start each show with a question that we'll explore together today. So just keep this in the back of your mind. Today's question is, what are you willing to take a stand for? This includes like putting your social capital and relationships at risk. So think about that really for just a moment. So this is part two, roles during changing times. In part one, which was called Agents of Change and Chaos, we explored the documented way culture has progressed through 500 years of Anglo-American history. And this is outlined in The Fourth Turning, a book by William Strauss and Neil Howe. This 80 or so year cycle is called a saculum, and it includes four turnings. The first turning is the high or a peak in society, a golden age, if you will. The second is the awakening, which we start to feel rumbles of like, maybe this golden era doesn't work for everyone. The third turning is the unraveling, where Our institutions stop working as well as they once did, and trust starts to decline. And that leads us to the fourth turning, the crisis, where things are breaking down, shit's getting weird, and we often have a longing for the good old days. Well, we entered the current fourth turning, the crisis period, in 2008 with the financial crisis and the Great Recession. And in part two today, we're going to explore the factions of people within each, uh, within the crisis period itself and their relationships to each other. So every great social change has predictable groups who either advance or resist solutions that are being called forth. And these four factions are the power holders those who have formal authority in society and are bolstered by people who prefer to avoid conflict. They want everything to stay the way it is. They have the power and they're happy. Now, the other three groups call for change in different ways. The first is the resistance. And these are the the activists, the protesters, those who will not bend the knee within a system that doesn't work for them or for their chosen people. These folks put themselves in harm's way. They might initiate violence, but typically they're trying to goad or uh, coax the, the power holders to violence themselves. They want to push the power holders to use violence. The next group are the persuaders. These are insiders who seek to change the breaking or broken system from within. They want to bolster the existing institutions so that they work better for more people. These are likely elected officials, uh, positive change influencers, uh, police, military, those kinds of, of folks who are inside the system, but not actively holding power in place. And then the final group here are the peacemakers. Now, peacemakers work to empower community members through largely unseen and, quite frankly, unsexy work. They provide on the ground training mediation, facilitation within communities, and often they support the resistance with nonviolent training, strategic planning, and also networks. 
Now, during a fourth turning, the crisis like we're in now, we will join one or more of these factions. By choice, we may become part of the resistance or the peacemakers as outsiders demanding change and empowering others to make changes in their lives. Persuaders will make choices to use their influence to encourage new policies and new laws or amendments to the Constitution. And if we're part of the power holder group, we are defending our way of life, full stop. The crisis period is an existential threat to the power holders. Now, by now, you may be thinking, I don't like these choices. I'm going to sit this one out. Well, by not choosing our position or taking a stand within this change driving time, we may become an unwitting supporter of the power holders. It is our desire to avoid conflict that sets up what Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. called negative peace. And that's where we prefer an orderly society to a just and free society. Power holders rely on people wanting to feel safe in an orderly and predictable society, and they make promises to provide that. But a predictable and orderly society is not the same as a free society based in justice, where we are all treated equally before the law. There are many dictatorships around the world where things are predictable and orderly, but people don't enjoy the rights of a free society. Singapore comes to mind. Now, these promises for protection and safety from, the, from conflict that the power holders offer become the excuse for both current and future oppression to keep the peace or law and order. And there's another subgroup of the power holders that I have mentioned in other shows. These are the conflict profiteers, those people who intentionally keep people confused about who is actually holding power and who is to blame for the civil unrest, who is to blame for our discomfort and feeling unsafe. And they feed us stories about who is the victim and who are the perpetrators in this drama cycle that never freaking ends. This flooding the zone with disinformation is where we find ourselves in 2024. We are in the midst of an information war. For myself, I have decided to trust testimony that is delivered under oath and evidence that is presented in court as believable. The rest of it, I'm skeptical about. Most everything else out there is spin or interpretation that is designed to keep us outraged so we can be manipulated. And many of our fellow citizens right now are being manipulated to violence or threatening violence. And whether this leads to physical war or not remains to be seen. Can we break the cycle? Remember every fourth turning in the 500 years of recorded history has ended in a major war. And also remember that it is our reaction to violence and to whom we assign blame that change or progress happens or doesn't. We can choose the change that happens and change will happen, make no mistake about that, because it's on schedule for this big saculum pattern that the fourth turning identifies. Now, conflicts have been resolved without war during second turnings, during the awakening periods. So we do have examples that we could follow. For instance, the suffrage movement ended its hundred years of advocacy with a constitutional amendment. Now, this wasn't because a whole bunch of people suddenly like decided women deserve the right to vote. No, it was influenced by widespread news of women being tortured and force fed that shifted the tide. Our emotional shift happened first. The policy came later, or the amendment in this case. And enough power holders had some movement in their emotional bodies uh, through hearing this news of torture that they shift, shifted from being a power holder to being a persuader. And then the dynamics shifted and the power holders actually became those holding the change. Now, in the 1960s, the Civil Rights Act became inevitable 
as Americans saw the violence of white Americans towards their black neighbors, and they were repelled. This new self-awareness of our dark past shifted our emotions with this acknowledgement that we were not treating our fellow citizens humanely or with dignity. And it was the rejection of the violence that created the path for legislation in 1964 and 1965. This followed decades of work by the resistance, the peacemakers, and the persuaders. When these three factions work together, power holders decide to shift the tide. They go with the flow. But until then, the conflict profiteers work to keep the three change factions at each other's throats. One more note about what comes next. After we make a shift or change in society, when the change is new and it feels really easily threatened, History has often shamed the losers of these conflicts. You know, during the American Revolution, the British loyalists were driven out of the newly formed United States and had to go back to England. In the Civil War, the South was humiliated in such a way that we still bear scars today. It was following World War II that we broke this cycle of humiliating the losing side of the war by rebuilding Germany and Japan. By offering a dignified place in the new order, we sidestepped creating a cycle of war with these same nations. And after all, aren't we all tired of the bullying and the tyranny and the domination culture in which we have grown up and which we currently live? I know I am. So we have a few more years of this crisis before we have a new social contract, a new order that provides more freedom, more rights, fingers crossed on that, uh, for all of us. We do face the possibility of being pulled into a war in Ukraine or the Middle East or maybe even China. And these global conflicts are at the center of some of the unrest in the United States right now today in 2024. The conflict profiteers, which today includes political candidates, add to the chaos by spinning stories about immigrants or trans people or women's reproductive rights, among other niche narratives. Some of these stories are true. Others are completely made up and others are exaggerated to increase our outrage and mobilize a base of voters. Remember our question for today's show? What are you willing to take a stand for? For change to happen and hold, we must find a dignified place in a new social contract for everyone, especially those people we dislike or with whom we disagree. Our ability to see dignity in everyone is the antidote that we need today. What would a world look like where we honored everyone from black men and women to older white people to fundamentalist Christians to Orthodox Muslims, from First Nation people to gun rights advocates, etc. What does dignity look like for you? For all of us. Robert Fuller said, dignity is the stepping stone from liberty to justice. So what if our economy was set up with a human dignity framework. Now bear with me for just a second here. Instead of money being the metric of success, we determine how to measure happiness in our lives. Globalization, extremism, mass migrations have ma led many of us to living in our survival mind, thinking that there is not enough in this world, not enough housing, not enough work, not enough food, not enough support, et cetera. And so we vote, we get manipulated, we vote, we elect leaders. But when leaders get power, what do they use it for? Do they consolidate power? Or do they modify or set up systems where people are empowered? Is it something else that they do with the power? When we are living in our survival mind, we can and often do devolve into the power over or domination dynamic. This is the root of most mass migrations 
as people flee from poverty, violence, and tyranny. Power over feeds trade agreements that benefit corporations but leave workers behind. And this domination mindset results in ideological wars in which extremist views are appealing because of the security they profess to provide. Now, in the American Future interviews that I conducted in 2023 and 2024, everyone, 100% of the people interviewed, expressed a desire for a dignified life. And for everyone to feel dignified in their life, we need to give up or reject this power over or domination culture in full. In its place, we want a system where contribution is rewarded. Ideally, we want a system where our survival mind is not needed for daily life. Get, think, let that think in for a second. What if we could live every day not worried about our survival? Our human spirit calls us to be free and the happiest people that we know are those who contribute to others. So what if the economic system rewarded and supported free and happy people and disincentivized domination? Perhaps it's an economic system waiting to be born. I'm still wild-eyed dreaming about that one. But remember, change is the only constant. So something new is coming. We just don't know what it is yet. So I want to end this podcast with a little meditation or visualization for you. Stop for just a few minutes where you are and close your eyes if you can. And imagine living in a community where everyone's basic needs are met including you. Everyone, including you, has shelter, food, health care, and a sense of safety. In this new community, people find ways to give to others, to contribute part of themselves. You know, the nurturing folks, they may prepare food for others or provide child care or elder care in a very loving way. They have space to really deeply care and show that. The artistic folks are creating beauty in their preferred expression. Maybe they're writing a poem or singing a song or painting a mural somewhere, but they're providing an uplift of our spirit, a pointing to that beauty around us. The organized folks among us may be helping with logistics, like identifying who has a need and who can meet that need and matching people up, connecting folks so that our contributions are received right where they're needed most. The brainy folks, you know, may th be thinking of new ideas or inventing new things to share with the community that might either make our lives easier, make the systems run better, uh, just be a novelty, fun thing, uh, another part of the creative artistic expression. And when we gather together for meals in this new community where everyone's needs are met, there's some healthy and playful banter exchanged at mealtime where we're demonstrating the care that we feel towards each other. As you imagine this community, what would you do if you knew your basics were covered? How would you behave differently in your life than you do today? One way that I'm contributing to our nation is helping individuals discover their own preferred future. Now, some of these interviews are part of the Terrified Nation podcast and others are blogs at AmericanFuture.us. You can be interviewed too. You can sign up with a self-interview or you can download the PDF and interview your friends and family. You can send your results to me. You can fill out the form online. It's part of a national research project to discover our shared preferred future as Americans. So just visit AmericanFuture.us, click on the self-interview button, or explore stories to create your own. In closing today's show, I'd like to thank you, the listeners, for giving a damn about our nation. We may be terrified today, but we can do better. There's a brighter future out there for us. We can save the USA. Join me next time. So that's it for today's episode of Terrified Nation. Head on over to iTunes or wherever you listen to subscribe to the show. You can get advance notice on new episodes and bonus content by signing up. 
head over to terrifiednation.com and join us on the next episode.